As the ushers pass out the offering buckets, I want to introduce to, to you tonight Susie Chun, who have been, she has been now. Uh, teaching in the courtyard in the past couple of weeks. So I'm going to welcome, welcome her up tonight. <laughs> Susie Chun, thank you. Are you ready? This is going to be fun. It's going to be so much fun. Now, how many of you are in her uh, class throughout the week? See, look, you know, are your students. <laughs> so, but uh, she is a Messianic Jew and has been teaching in our class the Jewish roots uh, of the church and, and different uh, things throughout the week. And so tonight, one of the things that opened my eyes was when Ephesians 2.15 talks about the Jew and Gentile becoming one. Now, it, it can almost seem like, well, it's Susie, it's Pastor Sheldon, you guys are teaching. But when, when you understand the background of what the Bible is saying, that Jew and Gentile will be one, then what you're seeing tonight with Jew and Gentile being one is a big thing. It is a major thing because this is what was said uh, thousands of years ago that the Jew and Gentile would become one. So not just one in spirit, but one in teaching. So thank you, Susie, for being here tonight. You're welcome. And so when she goes through uh, the different things, you should have a handout in your hand, and that should uh, help you to follow along. We'll have some scriptures up here. And uh, if, you, if you are taking notes, then write them down because this is going to be good tonight. So go for it, Susie. Okay. We'll have fun with this. Thank you, Pastor Sheldon. This is really exciting for me to be here tonight. And as we begin this, I just wanted to explain to you what it is to be a Messianic Jew and how that might relate to you. I was raised in a Jewish home, went to Hebrew school for many years. We celebrated the different holidays uh, throughout my life. And then by the grace of God as a young woman, I received Yeshua, Jesus as my Lord and Messiah. I call him Yeshua because that is his Hebrew name, and it means salvation, and it's actually the name that he's used to being called <laughs> when he was here on earth. So tonight I may go back and forth between Yeshua and Jesus, but if you hear the Yeshua, it means Jesus. After I received Yeshua, something funny happened in my life. I became more Jewish. And by that, I mean I began to read the Old Testament. I knew the Bible stories as a kid growing up, Noah's Ark and things like that. But I really began to dig into the Old Testament to see what it had to say and what was God's plan for his Jewish people. And so I began to see some very strong connections between the Old Testament, which the Jewish people will call the Tanakh, and the New Testament which um, the Hebrew word for that is the Brit Hadashah. And I began to see that it was really important for the church, the Gentile church, to begin to embrace its roots. And in line of that, this is the sixth class of the one I've been teaching on that. I just want to do a shout out to the brothers and sisters <laughs> who have been with me for the last six weeks. Shalom, Mishpaka. <laughs> that means peace or wholeness, as in no parts are missing, to my family. Can we try that again? Family. Try that again? Can Shal we all say it together? Sure. Because I feel like I'm left out. I'm like, oh. what? where am I? Okay. okay, try it. Go. Shalom. Shalom. Mishpuka. Mishpuka means family. And we are, are we not family? We are the family of God, right? So, and the word shalom is awesome because not, you've maybe heard it be peace or hello, goodbye, but the root of it means being whole, that none of your parts are missing. So if I say to Pastor Sheldon, shalom, Pastor Sheldon, I'm really saying to him, may all your parts be there, you know. <laughs> well, thank God. <laughs> I like that word. We should greet everyone like that. <laughs> Poor thing, Susie. She's teaching with me. <laughs> we'll, we'll be okay. <laughs> Jew and Gentile. Go ahead. Sorry. So one of the main reasons for the church to connect to its Jewish roots is to see God's faithfulness, first to the Jewish people, God's love, first to the Jewish people, and then his faithfulness and love to the whole world. And that is so evident when you begin to look at the Jewish roots. 
The Jewish people were called by God to show forth his love and faithfulness, and Moses made this calling clear after God had delivered the Jewish people from Egypt, from the bondage um, in, in Egypt, in slavery, and that was the first Passover. And listen to what he said. And it, but because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Tonight, we're going to learn about the Passover, and we will see God's love and his faithfulness, not only to redeem Israel, the Jewish people, from physical bondage, but everybody who will call on him from the bondage of sin and being the freedom of redemption that is in him. This Friday evening actually begins Passover. It's a couple of days early to do this. We can get to say some more Hebrew now. We're going to say happy holiday. And that is the word Hag Sameach. So you'll practice now. So on Friday, you can say this. Hag Sameach, happy, that which means happy holiday. Let's try it together. Hag, Hag Sameach. Sameach. One more time. Hag Samea. Good job. All right. It's a lot of, right? That's a lot of in, in Hebrew. <laughs> because it, it's a part of the, the Hebrew language. It's part of the Hebrew language. You've got you to gotta be able to do that to uh, speak people, Hebrew. Some people, they do that too good. So. <laughs> so tonight as we look at this appointed time, Passover, we're going to be doing a demonstration of what will happen in Jewish homes all over the world this Friday night. Some will do it on Saturday night. It's a demonstration, so you won't be able to participate in everything, but I think we're going to, well, I know we're going to include the most important parts in here so you will see. This ceremony is called a seder, which means set order, because there's an orchestrated order to, to the seder when you do this in a Jewish home. We use a book called a Haggadah, and this is, Haggadah means a telling, and it's kind of the program for the night. And you kind of have a little mini Haggadah in front of you, but it looks something like this or like this, and sometimes they're really big and beautiful books too. Now, the Haggadah contains the prayers and the songs and the things that you will do for the evening. Because this is a teaching demonstration, we won't follow the exact order of the Seder tonight as might be done in a Jewish home, but we will include the essential parts, maybe not in the exact order they would be done. And very importantly that you need to know, tonight's Seder that we're going to do is a Messianic Seder. It is being done with the knowledge that Yeshua is the Messiah. So we're going to see how he celebrated Passover and we're also going to look at the prophetic jewels that are embedded in the Passover celebration. So that makes it different than what you might see in a Jewish home. They would not be talking about Jesus or Yeshua in a Jewish home that is not a messianic home where there are believers. Okay, just to make that real clear. Yeshua, and sometimes this is an aha for people. Jesus was 100% Jewish, as were all his disciples. He kept this holiday, he kept all the holidays. In fact, he perfectly kept the law, the first five books of Moses out of the Old Testament. And so, as he would celebrate these holidays in, that you read about in the New Testament, he always used that time to reveal more about himself at each of these holidays. Because every single one of these appointed times, from Leviticus chapter 23, foreshadows is prophetic about who the Messiah is. So he did this absolutely. On Passover, he introduced the new covenant. Pastor Sheldon will be talking about that more later. It was so important this holiday that he spent his last night on earth with his disciples talking about the Passover. He said in Matthew 26, 18, my time is at hand. I am to keep the Passover. The church calls it the Last Supper 
But in reality, it was his last celebration of the Passover. It was at this Passover celebration that the new covenant was ushered in and the observance of what the church calls communion was started. We're going to see how that all fits together as we go along tonight. Matthew, the scripture that she just talked about, Matthew chapter 26, uh, verses 18 and 19, uh, you may have remembered this, that Jesus said, go into the city of a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And so the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So this is the basic setting of how they had the Passover. Uh, I'm not sure if the cameras can catch this, but they, were, they would recline at the table and... Some of us see the picture of um, Leonardo da Vinci. You know, he painted the famous picture of the Last Supper, and it's laid out in a straight form. But it wasn't like that. It was actually like this. It's called the triclinium, where you would have three sets on this, uh, three sides, and this is where Jesus would have sat, and this is where John, the disciple, would have sat, and then this is where Judas sat. Now, on this side, where Judas sat was a place of honor. And we know what Judas did. And this is where John was leaning against Jesus Christ. So they didn't have chairs like how we have chairs. They had big pillows like this. And so they would actually recline, and they would, like, be kicking back like this. And then they would eat with one hand. That's how they would eat. Some of you eat with two, but you can't right now because your elbow is down, so they would eat. That's how... They could, as the Bible said, John was leaning against Jesus' chest. It's like when you're talking story, you're just hanging out, and you have like a friend behind you just kind of kicking back, saying, hey, so what you going to do? Oh, I'm going to go cruise. Okay. So it's, well, not that was more, was more holy than that, but it kind of, so you get, the, you get the picture. Because I used to think, why would John be leaning against Jesus' chest? That's not normal. You know, that's not, why would he do that? You don't go over to your friend's house and just say, can I lean on your chest, please? I just want to talk story. It was just in the comfort of how they would sit down and relax. So it was a normal setting. It was, they were hanging out with Jesus Christ, but he was doing something so profound that it was one of those moments that when Jesus instructed them on doing certain things, that they began to understand that there's something deeper that's happening than what we see. But they couldn't piece it all together until... Jesus died on the cross and then rose from the grave. At the time when Jesus was with them at their Passover meal, and he started to talk about the different things that were happening, some of the disciples had to have wondered what all of this is meaning. Well, what is this all about? And so with the Passover, when Jesus was having that meal with them, he he wanted to help them understand why he came and what was about to take place. If Jesus didn't do the last, or we call it the uh, Passover, that last Passover with them, and he just verbalized it to them, it wouldn't have had as much significance as when he was reclining with them and then talking to them about how things are going to take place, especially when he said to go get it ready. Because like Susie was saying, he, he made sure he did all of the traditions and made sure that he was 100% in line with what was to take place as a Jew. And so Susie's going to talk a little bit about uh, what the Passover is all about, and then we'll, we'll continue with that. But that's kind of the setting that they had. It wasn't just a flat table. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good. Passover, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the Passover and today how it is celebrated today in Jewish homes. It's the oldest continuously celebrated holiday in the world since about 1440 BC. When it was instituted by God, he said it's to be celebrated forever. It's one of three Jewish holidays that requires all Jews to go to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. And so it was a really important one. It is, takes place in spring. And it actually marks the beginning of the Jewish calendar. It begins on the 14th the, at sunset. All Jewish holidays, all Jewish days begin at sunset. So 
this Friday will be the 14th of Nisan, and that's when the holiday will begin, and Passover is actually the 15th of Nisan, so at evening, it kind of becomes the next day. So when we read our Bible and it says the first day started at Nisan, uh, they, because they follow the lunar calendar. Exactly. It wasn't the solar calendar like how we follow. Right. Because we're following seasons, they followed the new moon. Right. Which when you read your Bible, that's why you hear a lot of new moon. And um, uh, part of it too is we have our solar calendar and we have the lunar calendar, but they don't match up. So they, on that night or that evening, which began that first day, if you read in Genesis, that's exactly what God said. The evening and the morning was the first day. So that's why they start in that day. So. Look outside Friday night. What are you going to see? Full moon. Full moon. Yeah. These Jewish appointed times, all except for one of them, fall, fall on the full moon. And that's how they reckoned when it starts. Yeah. Okay. So it's actually made up of three holidays. The whole holiday is kind of called Passover. But you can see on the slide here, the first... Uh, part of it is on the 14th, starts on the 14th of Nisan, and that's the Passover, and that's when people will have these seders. The next day begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that goes on for seven more days where no leavening is eaten in homes. And then on the third day, the third day, mind you, of this holiday, it's called the Feast, the First Fruits of the Harvest. And so each of these are associated prophetically with Passover, Jesus' death, unleavened with his burial, and then first fruits with his resurrection, because he did resurrect on the third day, too. Okay, so in Jewish homes, right before Passover, there is a frenzy of cleaning going on. <laughs> it's done by the woman of the house, and there she is, doing everything. <laughs> cooking and cleaning, because there cannot be any, un, uh, any leavening in the house. No yeast, no baking soda, no bread, anything that has leavening. It is cleared out. The word for leaven is uh, hummus, and they are looking that no hummus will be, no crumbs will be left in the house. And this is where spring cleaning came from, ladies, okay? Which is what they did uh, when the first Passover. They had to scrub everything. Right. And I thought, you know when Jesus talks about the heart of man? It's kind of the same thing. It's you scrub everything in there. That it's what comes out of the heart that's going to be evil, and uh, that's where everything will come out of. And so when we say to God, "Create in me a clean heart, O God," you could see that everything was pointing towards mm. Jesus Christ. Even the 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 way they would clean their home, it was a physical object that was relating to us spiritually. And it's like God. He's he's such an illustrative God that he will show us in the physical what we should be doing spiritually. Right. And I was going to say it later. It was a good time to say it now. Sin in the Bible is related to leavening, is, mm -hmm. is related to sin. And so it's getting out the sin. And I think what you said, that God is always, there are lots of things that we do, but they all have inner meaning. Mm -hmm. All have inner meaning. So as a child, I really looked forward to Passover. It was a great holiday, extended family the kids all sat at one table, and we got to drink wine for the first time in our lives. We have grape juice tonight, but traditionally you'll find wine in a Jewish home. For a week, we only ate unleavened matzah. Okay, here's some matzah right here. So for one solid week, bologna and matzah sandwiches. Wow. <laughs> eggs and matzah. If, you it's know, like a transformation <laughs> week. <laughs> and then... The, the part that I got to do, I was the youngest in the family, and I got to do this thing called the four questions. And it's basically the youngest saying, what's going on here? So we've asked Aiden to be our Jewish child tonight. And come on up. Hi, Aiden. Why is this night different from all other nights? Why are we eating only matzah unleavened bread? Why are we eating bitter herbs? Why are we leaning or reclining? Why do we dip our vegetables? Terrific. Thank you, Aiden. All right. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the answer was always given by my father or the head of the household. And basically, because we're doing things differently tonight, 
he tells the Passover story, the history of when the Jews were slaves in Egypt and how Moses came and that first Passover. So I'm going to ask the head of the household here <laughs> so, to tell the story. So if you uh, read Exodus chapter 12, it's going to give a better, a broader uh, perspective of, of what we're going to be talking about. But the Passover and the answer to Aiden's questions would basically be the story of how God came and rescued the Jews from slavery. They were enslaved for 430 years. Remember that, that they were uh, enslaved with the Egyptians. And so God heard their cry for deliverance, and God gave them a deliverer whose name was Moses. And so remember, Moses went to Pharaoh, and he said, let my people go. And remember Pharaoh, he said, no, I'm not going to let your people go. In fact, he needed the Jews because they were the slaves that made everything happen. They were the ones that were uh, building things, and they were the workers. So he said, I'm not going to let you go. Well, after a while, God was going to relieve their suffering in such a way that Pharaoh would see that there was something that God was doing with the Jews. Or in, in that time when you read the Bible, it says Hebrews. Hebrew means foreigner. So you're going to hear Hebrew. You're going to hear Jew. You're also going to hear Israelite. So th they're the same people. Uh, just at different times, they call them different things. So the 430 years, God heard their cry. And Moses goes to Pharaoh and says that God said to let my people go so that my people can worship me. Well, Pharaoh does not want to. And the idea is that God was going to relieve their suffering, but they might get away, that they might be removed from the idols of Egypt because they had all of their gods. In fact, the ten plagues represented the gods of Egypt, except for the last plague. And that last plague, we see the plagues up here. And these plagues were a part of God saying, to the people of Egypt, I am more powerful than your gods that you're worshiping because they don't exist. The Israelites were in a land called Goshen, Goshen, and that land was actually given to them when Joseph, if you rewind the tape, was second in command. Remember Joseph rose up. I'm sorry I'm giving all of that, but they were in that land of Goshen, so they were protected by all of these plagues except the last plague which was death of the firstborn. So the death of the firstborn was the angel of death coming through the entire land and killing the firstborn. The only way the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews, would be saved and spared, or their firstborn would be spared, is if they did what God asked them to do and they were to take a lamb and they would take the blood and a hyssop branch and they would dip it and remember what they had to do? They painted the doorpost of their home. Sorry, this is very thick paint. <laughs> but it represents, represents the blood of the lamb. I need someone who's six feet. So just try not to get it all over. So if you think about what they were doing, they were painting the blood over their doorposts. And then what would happen? When the angel of death came through, who built this thing? <laughs> this is, wasn't me. Okay. So that's what they did. I just want to mention here that that shape that you're seeing right now of up and across and down is the same thing I'm wearing around my neck. It's the Hebrew word chai, which means life. And so God was protecting them. He was uh, granting them. There you'll see that's the uh, word chai right there. And you can see how that first part looks like the doorpost as the angel of death would pass over their homes and protect them, give them life. So the, the scripture in Exodus chapter 12, I'll read from verses 5 through 8. It says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. 
Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. And then in verse 26, it says, And it shall be when your children say to you, like how Aiden just did, What do you mean by this service that you shall say, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. In other words, it was a permanent ordinance. That's why it's still celebrated today in, a, in the Passover. So it, it needed to continue so that the children would continue to ask and the parents would pass down to the next generation what God had done. And you're going to see why it's called a forever celebration. Because mm. the Gentile church, we get to celebrate it. And I'm not talking about just the Seder part, but as we see the fulfillment of it, we continue to celebrate this redemption from death. And that is the uh, pro prophetic meaning of it embedded in there. Mm. Okay. I want to uh, say a quote from... Moish Rosen, who we were privileged to meet before he went to be with the Lord. He was the founder of Jews for Jesus. He said about the idea that this holiday goes on forever, the Lord's redemption of Israel needed to be stamped indelibly on the minds and hearts of future generations. God, the master teacher, devised the perfect method. He commanded the annual reenactment of that first Passover night a ceremony that would appeal to the senses of each person of every generation. And indeed, this celebration of the Passover is a sensory object lesson, if you would, because we taste, we touch, we smell, we see God's beautiful truths embedded in this whole celebration tonight. If we were doing a regular Seder in a home, we would be seated around, this is our modern Seder table, you know, the last... Say last the Passover over there. My ancestors over here. But this is how it would be in a modern, we would be seated around the table here. And there's a spot right here. And this is a seat is always saved for the prophet Elijah. Because Jews believe that Elijah will, and it's from Malachi, that Elijah will hurl the coming of the Messiah. Because the Jewish people do not believe that the Messiah has come yet. So we have... Elijah's place, he's got a cup, and, and at the end of the Seder, a child will go to the door and say, Elijah, and in fact, all the children here, why don't you yell, Elijah. Let's give him a three count. better. <laughs> <laughs> Try it again. Eli what did you say, Elijah? Elijah. Elijah. Okay. And you call for him at the door, but he doesn't come every Passover because Yeshua said, Jesus said, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. And indeed, John the Baptist hurled, he introduced, he ushered in Jesus to the world. And that was his role. And, and Jesus said he came in the spirit of Elijah. So that has been fulfilled in that. Also on this plate, on this table, we see a big Seder plate here. And it has several things on it that we're going to dip and eat. Um, as we do this Seder demonstration. There's also a, there's candles, there's some salt water, there's this bag called a matzotosh that has three matzahs in it. And if we were at a home having Seder dinner, we would not do what we're gonna do next. But because this is an assembly, we are going to have the blowing of the shofar. So we've asked Matt, to blow it, and this is the scripture that goes with it. Because the blowing of the shofar can be done for many things, a battle cry, it can be the coronation of a king, but it's also a call to assembly, and that's what we're doing right now. So in Numbers 10.10, 10, it says, 
Also in the day of your gladness and in your appointed feasts and on the first day of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be as a reminder of you before your God. I am the Lord your God. Mm. I didn't know he was going to do that. Matt, that was awesome. Does See, that, like, I want to go into battle. Does that right? not resonate, just, uh, huh? You just Woo. feel that you want to do something. Wow. That's what I feel. I mean, if you were there, there's no way you're going to be sleeping through that. If you're a warrior and you hear that sound, you're up and you're ready to go. They, they do say the shofar, the blowing of the shofar is a wake-up call, too. A wake-up yeah. call to us to wake up to God, too. So part of that, I mean, when you blow the trumpets, you know how God says to worship with the instruments? It's kind of mm -hmm. like the same thing. When we worship, we're getting ready for the king. Exactly. Because he's being called. Oh, I love this. Take a look as you're going through your Bible about all the times it talks about the blowing of the trumpet or the blowing of the yeah. shofar, too. And that's how he comes back. Exactly. You're going to hear the trumpet call. Exactly. That's exactly. awesome. Okay. So we're actually beginning <laughs> now the Seder. <laughs> it always starts with the lighting of candles. And the woman of the house lights the candles. And the idea is there's a candle, one, two candles, one meaning observance and one meaning remembrance. And in your program or your mini Haggadah, you have the English to what I'm going to say in the Hebrew. So please join me as we go into the English part. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melhalam. And if you know this part too, please join me. Asher Kiddushanu V'mitzvah Savvitzivanu L'Halikner Shal Yom Tov. And then the English. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and has commanded us to kindle the holiday lights. Amen. Amen. On Passover, I'm just going to put this down for a sec. On Passover, four cups of wine are drunk. Well, actually, you don't drink four cups of wine because you would be drunk right. if you drank four <laughs> cups of wine. <laughs> you have a glass of wine at your, you have a glass at your table, and you drink from it four times throughout the night. But to make it clear here, we put the four cups out for you, and they each have a specific name and a specific meaning. And the promises for each of these cups come from Exodus 6, 6 through 7. I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. Mm -hmm. And this first cup, the cup of sanctification, it relates to that first promise, I will bring you out. And bring you out doesn't mean just, I'm bringing you out of Egypt. Bring you out also means to be set apart because indeed when he brought them out, he brought them out to worship him, to be a people holy to him. And when the Lord brings us out of our sin and to him, he wants us to be set apart in righteousness and holiness for his purposes. So that's the what, idea. What is neat about that too, Susie, is... The church, that word church, ecclesia, actually means the called out ones. Mm. So we mm. still, even till today, mm. we're called out of our sin. We're called out of 
a, a slavery of sin and the bondage of the world, and we're called out to be lights into the world. And that's what Jesus did. He built his church, that the gates of hell cannot even prevail against it. And that's you. That's what was happening back then. It was all lining up to where Jesus was going to come, die for our sins, so that we could continue to carry out what he intended us to carry out. Exactly. That's what he called out. Oh, neat. I didn't make that connection before. And on the n night of the, uh, the Last Supper, the Last Passover, he took that cup. And this is what it says. I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this. Divide it among yourselves. For I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And that's from Luke chapter 22. And the man of the house always says this, so we're going to have Pastor Sheldon. He's going to talk in Hebrew. I'll try my best. <laughs> and we'll join him in the English. Okay, so I'm going to do the Hebrew first, and then you guys can join me in the English. It should be up here uh, after. So as the man of the house, I would say, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Borei Pri Hagafin Amen. Blessed, Blessed are, are you, you, O Lord, Lord our God, King, King of the universe, universe who, who creates the, the fruit of the vine. vine. Amen. Amen. You can uh, drink take a drink. This, right? Next in order in the Seder is the washing of hands. Can I just yeah. do this for you? you? Okay, and there's a prayer said over it. And then we even have a towel for you. Okay, and that's done for everybody that's at the Seder. Sorry, it's... No problem. <laughs> and the idea there is that, that we are priests. The Jewish idea is that everybody is a priest in their own home. And their own home is like a temple, and the temple priests had to wash their hands to get ready for this service. And I think that's a beautiful thought. But on the night of the last Passover, when it was time to wash hands, he Yeshua did something amazing. He didn't wash their hands. He washed their feet. Yeah, so there's a bucket over there. Or as they were reclining, as you could see, when they were lying down or, or, or reclining sideways or whatever it was, their feet, were ex their feet were exposed so that they could come, Jesus could come and wash their feet. So the Bible says he took his outer garment, wrapped it around his waist, took, took some water and a basin, and he washed their feet. And the washing of feet was Jesus now saying that you are, you are clean. That your, your body, your soul is already clean because of the word. But someone who has been walking around, only their feet needs to be washed. In other words, you and I already are already washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we still walk in this world, and we trample on dirt in this world. We still trample on sin. We still have mistakes and flaws. And Jesus says, that's why I come to wash your feet. And when he washed his feet, what Jesus showed them was an example for all of us that we should do the same. That when we wash each other's feet, it's a humble way of saying, I came to serve not to be served. And when we have that mentality in every area of our lives as believers, that we say, I came to serve, not to be served. You know how many uh, things we can, or years of heartache and pain we can save from our lives by saying, I, it's not about me. It's about serving the Lord. It's about serving. I save years of pain and suffering of saying, what's in it for me? Or saying, oh, I, I'm due this, Some, that you owe me something. Or you have like a, a spirit of uh, entitlement that, you know, I, I've served Jesus all these years. And how, why don't they, why, why, don't, why doesn't he do this for me? Or, or why don't they do this for me? And we almost get this spirit of entitlement. And Jesus was simply saying to his disciples, it's not about that. You go wash each other's feet because the, the one that is going to be great is going to be the least among you. The servant of all is the greatest of all. 
And that's what he said about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the last prophet, but the closest one to Jesus Christ. The last prophet of the Old Testament, but the closest to Jesus. And John the Baptist was the one who said, behold, the Lamb of God. And when John the Baptist stated those words, it's like everything started to connect. And people started to look to him as, wait a minute, you're the Lamb of God. They knew about lambs, obviously. They knew about that. And so when he was called the Lamb of God, and now they're here at the Passover meal, everything starts to tie in. And the major thing that took place when Jesus washed their feet was Jesus saying, you are now my friends. That now as I wash your feet, you go do that to someone else and you serve one another. Exactly. Exactly. He was preparing them for the service, for the Great Commission, because they were going to be sent out to share his love and the gospel throughout the whole world. And mm -hmm. that was a part, the great humility of it and the preparation for that task that he was giving to them. You know, Yeshua always takes something, like the washing of hands, and he elevates it mm -hmm. to what is God's heart behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not about clean hands. It's about a clean heart. It's about a servant's heart, really. Yeah, yeah that's why he told the Pharisees, you're like whitewashed tombs. Because they were doing all the outward things, there and, and they couldn't connect it to what Jesus was trying to say. And, and, and we're going to explain a little bit more, but the, the Pharisees were so blinded by the law and the rituals and the traditions that they couldn't see what Jesus was doing. They could not see what he came to do. And, and, and even the, the prophecies that Jesus was actually fulfilling, they couldn't even see that because they didn't have what Jesus was doing with his disciples that I came to serve. They were all about what's in it for me. And so now Jesus changes everything at this one moment at this Passover. And it affects us today. And I, I'm sure after tonight, you will no longer receive communion the same ever again. It's going to be different. And it's going to be good. Okay. Back to the traditional Seder in a Jewish home. The next thing that's done is there is some parsley taken, and uh, it's called the carpus, and it's the idea of greens, and it's dipped in some salt water and eaten. You want to try? Okay, okay, sure. And that is the idea of... <laughs> oh, okay. Baruch HaTad, I forgot to say the blessing. That's why oh, you're sorry. reacting. Baruch HaTad, and I... say it. Eloheinu melech alam. Berei peri ha'adama. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, God, our, Lord God, our God, King, King of, of the universe, universe who, who creates, creates the fruit, fruit of, of the earth. earth. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to do now it. Now I eat. <laughs> can I, okay. okay, I can drink that water, right? Can I? Sure. I can drink you that can water? Drink, you can drink some more of the first No, I'm going to drink the whole thing. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> wow. It's salty. That's like eating ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next we come to a really important part of this. It's perfect. That wasn't important? Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> hmm. Now, life is mixed with tears, but... Yes, it is. Okay. It, and it's bitter on purpose. <laughs> we haven't got to the horseradish yet. All right. Yeah, I, I know. And I, I do not like horse, okay. horseradish. <laughs> Wait, what? Horseradish. Yeah, right. Okay, this is gonna, making sense now. Yeah, okay. With the bitterness of the Egyptians, they, they, they left in bitterness or the, the yes. bitterness of slavery. Right. That's not even what that one was about. It's the horseradish. This well, is life that mixed with tears. But. Um, life with tears. Okay. <laughs> but that has to do with the bondage. Yeah. Here we have something called the matzotash. And the matzotash is a three compartmental, it's a bag with three compartments in it holding three matzas. Okay. So wh why are there three matzas? Okay. Good question. The Jewish people will tell you that it's Abraham, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or uh, the Levites and the um, priests and the people. But we're going to take this middle matzah and break it, the one from the middle. And so it doesn't make, I'm going to take it out right now, the middle matzah, and it doesn't make much sense that we would be breaking Isaac or breaking the Levites. As a messianic believer, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
And this is the bag that is on every Jewish table. And there's really no great explanation as to what are these three, uh, what is these three matzahs about. But I think it's prophetic mm -hmm. of the Lord and the Father and the Holy Spirit. The afikoman is broken. Okay. And then this is what is done in every Jewish home. It's taken and wrapped in white linen or its own special little bag like this. And then it is hidden away by the father of the house. But wait one sec. The father of the house. And then it is found by the child. So it's hidden, buried, then found, resurrected by the child. And then the father of the house redeems it back. Now, the Jews, Jewish people do this. It's fun for the kids, but not with any kind of understanding. It's the middle matzah broken. So, Aiden, could you close your eyes because you're going to hunt for it a little bit yeah. later. And Pastor's going to hide it on the stage. Okay. Okay. Somewhere. All right. And so while he's doing that. So indecisive. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. At the last Passover, Yeshua broke the matzah. It says he did. He broke the bread. This idea of hunting for it, hiding away, and hunting for it was not done then. This was added by Messianic believers later, but it's carried on to this day in all Jewish homes. It, the, this afikoman is also called the bread of affliction, and the idea is each person who celebrates the Passover at a Seder is supposed to feel like they have been in Egypt, in bondage, afflicted, and identify, not just say, oh, that was what happened a long time ago, but really identify with it. And we as believers can say hallelujah because Yeshua, Jesus, became our bread of affliction for us. He took our sins for us. And so that we could have redemption through him. We could experience the sweetness of salvation. Amen? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at the modern matzah. I'm going to hold the whole piece up so you can see. And maybe you want to get a tight on this. Is that the best way to do it? No? Okay, good. <laughs> Are you smiling just to make sure in case? Okay. okay. That was good. <laughs> you can look at this matzah, and it's unleavened. There's no yeast in this matzah. And leavening, as I mentioned before, is equated with sin. The scripture that goes with that is 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 7. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole loaf? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since, truly, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed, sacrificed for us. And we're going to get to that part about Christ being the Passover in just a minute. But we can see clearly here that the matzah is flat, it's unleavened, but it also has holes in it. It's like as if it was pierced. In the preparation of this modern matzah, they poke holes in it so it will not rise. And in the baking process, it makes it striped at the same time. Maybe I should hold it this way. You see the stripes that way. Okay. This is what Isaiah said about the stripes. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Mm -hmm. oh, it's up on the screen now, so that's okay. And then about the piercing, he said, I will pour out on the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look unto me whom they have pierced. And you can't get more crystal clear about that when Jesus went to the cross and they pierced his side, that everything was pointing to Jesus Christ. And if, if you can understand that the whole Old Testament, that when you read it, yeah, there's the different wars and all of those things that are happening, but when, when you can grasp what the Old Testament was all about, you're going to find out that it, everything was pointing to Jesus Christ. And the, the, whole Old Test, the whole New Testament is all about Jesus Christ or pointing towards his return. And so even with this prophetic word in Zechariah, that they shall look upon, they shall look unto me who they have pierced and being, the, being of the house of David. You know, when you read in, I think it's in the book of Matthew, when they trace the lineage of Jesus Christ, it goes back to the uh, lineage of David, King David. So these things are not just 
minor things to read over and just brush over. These are, these are through hundreds of years of prophetic words coming to life. When Jesus arrives, he fulfilled the promises of God that God said thousands of years before Jesus even showed up. Right. And then comes, this is the time in the regular Seder where you would tell the story of what happened, but we already did that. So then there's a time of singing a song of thanksgiving to God. It's a song of thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. It's called dainu. Dainu is the Hebrew word for it would have been sufficient. For example, Lord, if you had only brought us out from Egypt but not let us cross the Red Sea, it would have been sufficient. If you had only destroyed the Egyptian army and not taken us into the promised land, it would have been sufficient. That's what they say anyway. But I think they wanted to get the promised land. <laughs> but anyway, the idea is one of thankfulness. So our one new man over here, our, our Gentile part, is going to lead in the Hebrew singing of Dainu. It's just one word. It's one word? The chorus. We're just going to do the chorus. Yeah, but it's, it's tricky. So I'm going to sing it, and then we're all going to sing it together. Are you up for this? Okay, this is like holy karaoke. This is, this is going to be really good. Okay, so it goes, Dai, Dai, Yenu, Dai, Dai, Yenu, Dai, Dai, Yenu, Dai, Yenu, Dai, Yenu. So you caught that second part. You're going to have to pause. Okay, let's, I'll do it slower with you guys, okay? You want to try it? Ready? Go. See, some of you guys never pause. Let's try again. Okay, one more time. Ready? Go. Give yourselves a hand. That was pretty good. Not bad. Okay. Putting that on Instagram, somebody was filming. Let's not do that. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm going to look at a couple of the elements that were not on, this, on the table of the last Passover. One is this, the egg. It's a roasted egg. It's a symbol of the temple sacrifices. Of course, when the temple, the Jewish temple was still there, the only way for atonement for sins was the slaughtering of animals, the sacrifice of animals, the shedding of blood that would atone for their sins. The temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, and that caused a major upheaval to the Jews that did not believe in Yeshua, the ones that did not believe that he was the Messiah. And so they'll dip this egg in some salt water. We won't do it for you right now. Oh, and, um, it's good. And as a kind of a memorial to it, because in Judaism right now, there is no temple, so there can be no sacrifice. So the way to get right with God is through prayers and repentances and good works. But we know that God never rescinded that need for blood, mm -hmm. for the atonement for sins. And it says in Hebrews 9.22, and according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So there's a picture of the temple, but we know who shed his blood for us. And the, and the Bible says, remember, it says the life is in the blood. So when they, when they destroyed the, the temple in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple, the people, the Jews, some of them could remember what Jesus said that this temple, every stone will be destroyed and not one stone will be left standing. And they said, how, how is that going to happen? It took us 40 years to build this thing. Were you gonna, it's going it's to, someone's just going to take it down. And he says, but destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. So they, they couldn't even tie in what Jesus was trying to say. And as Susie was saying, we know it as Jesus now becoming that sacrifice, dying for our sins and rising from the grave so that the temple worship, I mean, it can't be more perfect than that, that the temple worship is no longer there, but Jesus is, and he is the high priest forever, that he's going to reign forever and ever. So we have the opportunity of connecting all that was taking place back then to our Savior, that he did everything with purpose and precise in what he did. He was so precise and made sure that everything was connected back to what God was already doing long ago. So... Exactly. It's really connected. That leads to this other element, which would not have been in, on Yeshua's table. And this is the shank bone of the lamb. 
And again, it is the memorial to the Passover lamb that was, whose blood was used at the Passover to, for the angel of death to pass over. At the time of Yeshua, and he went to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, at that time, there would be thousands of lambs coming into Jerusalem, and the people would say to the lambs, Hoshiana, Hosanna, and as the lambs, all these lambs save us because every Jewish person associates a lamb with being saved. And so when Yeshua came in to Jerusalem during that same time, they said to him, Hoshiana, Hosanna, save us. They, some recognized him mm -hmm. for who he was going to be and some did not, but they were hoping that he was coming to save them. And so they greeted him in the same way they would greet the lambs. And when they took the lamb to the temple, they had to make sure it was unblemished. And the priest would lay his hands on the lamb, and in, his intent was to transfer the sins of the people onto this innocent, unblemished lamb. They roasted the lamb with fire. They did not break any of his legs. That is all prophetic, mm -hmm. and it all points to Jesus. Every year as a kid growing up, I thank God for the Passover mm -hmm. lamb, small l who saved my people. As a new believer, as a young woman, as a new believer, and I read in the Gospel of John for the first time, I became unglued. It says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, when, uh, when you pray for a revelation for Jewish eyes, for that veil to be lifted because they know deep in deep in themselves, that it's the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And the scripture you read earlier uh, about him being pierced, what makes this part of Jesus' death so profound is he, he cannot be pierced on his side unless his legs was not broken. In order for his legs to not be broken, he would have had to have been dead when they checked on him. And the only way he was able to be uh, dead at that specific time was if he gave up his life willingly. If you read the scripture, the two thieves that were on the opposite sides of Jesus, they were still alive. And remember, they came and they saw that they were alive, and so they broke the legs of the two thieves so that suffocation could be quicker because they, they needed to take these bodies down. Remember, this is Passover weekend. This is, the, this is Passover. So they didn't want these bodies up there, so they needed to take it down. But when they came to Jesus, they were going to break his legs, but they found that way he's already dead. So no sense break his legs to cause him to suffocate quicker and die, but just to make sure they pierced his side. And when they pierced his side, the Bible said that blood and water came gushing out. That is all precisely an order of what God was already doing when the Passover was instituted. And then when Jesus instituted communion that we know of today, he is the one that took upon all of the wrath of God right there at that very moment. And that's what these cups represent. Right. And this second cup, which we're going to take now, this is the cup of plagues or judgment. And it was that uh, because of the angel, the plagues that happened and the judgment that took place and the scripture that goes with that, with the uh, second cup. Did you have that slide on the second cup about God delivering? Is this First Peter? This is, well, we, you can say First Peter. Yeah, we're a little bit past that. <laughs> yeah, first, that's okay. First Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like mm. silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And then Revelation 5, 12, it says, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Okay, join Pastor Sheldon again in the English as he says the Hebrew, bruh. And then I drink this mm -hmm. after, okay? So I'm going to say the... Barahata. Okay. Barahata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam 
Bore pri hagafen. Amen. Now in English, blessed are you, O Lord our, our God, God, King of the universe, who, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Amen. And drink. Next, and you know, for time, I don't know whether we should. All eat. I know is that's way better than that. Okay, well, not really. Okay, what's going to happen? <clears throat> but we'll s first, some horseradish is put on some matzah, and the horseradish is bitter herbs, the bitterness of bondage, the sweetness of the matzah helps to ameliorate that. <laughs> and then also, but we're going to combine it as one and let Pastor Sheldon, after that is done, you kind of put a little bit of horseradish. It's not a little bit, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's good, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, it's okay. supposed to be like that okay. because it represents the bitterness. And, and the bitterness, and we used to call this like the Jewish tristan, you know, just clear your sinuses right out of there. Okay, yeah, and so this is, this um, mixture right here is called haroseth. It's apples and honeys, and it's like the mortar that the Jewish people used to build buildings for the Egyptians. So we kind of have a mix of sweetness and bitterness here, and the so, matzah is like <laughs> our savior. So, so I hope it saves you. Okay, okay. so the matzah... Yes. It's sinless, sinless because it's unleavened. Yes. The bitterness is like the bitterness of sin. Right. And, but Jesus came to remove. Right. The sinless Jesus came to remove the bitterness of sin. And that's like 1 Corinthians 5, 21. Can For he made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. <laughs> you okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Oh. <laughs> One more thing about this dipping. Remember, Pastor said that Judas was right there? Well, and it said that whoever dips with me is going to betray me. And there was Judas right there, right next to him, so he dipped with him. And the, in the Jewish culture, dipping was a sign of honor. So again, you see Yeshua's humility. He dipped with, I'm just checking to make sure you're okay. He yeah. dipped with, I have um, to swallow this right. with Judas. Okay. You want to go out there? No, no. You can do this it. This makes so much sense, though, because how bitter this is, sin is worse. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, after this, what would come next if we were all sitting at my house for Seder is a fabulous meal. Matzo bowl soup, chicken, all kinds of things. But we're not going to be doing that tonight. And then after the Passover meal, traditionally nothing was eating. And this is where Yeshua did something absolutely revolutionary. And so we're going to have Aiden come back, and you're going to get helped. Just wait one second, Aiden. If he, did you all see where he hit it? Because I didn't. But if you did, let's help Aiden by going cold, warm, getting warmer, hot. You know that game? Okay. Help Aiden out here. The cold. Warm, warm, cold, well, warm. No, cold. You're getting warmer. You're getting warmer. No, not cold. Cold. Freezing cold. Warmer. Hot. Hot. Boiling. Boiling. Furnace. There you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All See? right. He is risen. The father of the house will now redeem back the oh, Alfie Coleman. To... Come, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Just spend that all in one place because you really can't. <laughs> so, <laughs> Inflation. Sorry. Should, should I give him more money? Just like that. <laughs> That's good. Okay. So this is, um, at this point in the Passover Seder, the celebration of the Passover, Yeshua did that radical thing. He took the bread and he broke it. And he talked to his disciples. So we're usher, our ushers are going to pass out the, uh, the juice in the bread right now. And so you're all getting a piece of matzah right now. That's what you're getting. They'll get it to you. So what you do is you just take one and hang on to it. Hang on to the juice and the matzah. And you'll be okay.
and just hang on to them. So you're getting this piece of broken matzah and a sample of the third cup, which is the cup of redemption. So just hang on to them. And at this point of the Passover meal, Jesus, Yeshua, this is when he fully revealed himself as the Passover, uh, as the Savior and Redeemer, the one who would fulfill this Passover. So no longer were we to just eat a piece of matzah at Passover. We were to do so with the full remembrance of the amazing grace of God that he came to exchange our sins for his righteousness. That's what is happening right now. So you can just take the, yeah, take them, take one and, and pass it down. So, and just hang on to them. And then concerning the Afikomen, it is written, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them. And then he said these words, this is my body, which is given for you. Remember those words he said after? Do this in remembrance of me. And then concerning the Messiah, it is written, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So as we eat this living bread, think about what Yeshua, what he meant when he said he is giving life to the world. Not only did he mean eternal life, but he meant he was giving us life with power to obey God's word. That's why we need him. His life in us enables us to be who he wants us to be, not who we want to be. We went, we went down that road already, but we need him in our lives so that we can become what he wants us to be. This is what we remember at communion when we eat the matzah. So we have the third cup, you want to do, you want to say the, the cup ghost? of redemption, and you can say the Hebrew prayer. Do you want to do we'll eat this now? Eat this now. Uh, do we, does everyone have, is everybody good? Okay, we can do that now. Okay, so he... Yeshua said, do this in remembrance of me. From now on, when you are celebrating, he was saying to my people, from now on, whenever you're celebrating, you do this in remembrance of me. And I'm going to say the Hebrew blessing over it. Baruch atadonai Eloheinu melahalam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. The scripture from Exodus that matches the third cup, the cup of redemption, is I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Now, outstretched could have many meanings, but what did Jesus do on the cross? He stretched out his arms and he died for us. That's how we were redeemed. It was through Jesus Christ and the outstretching of his arms. The cup of redemption Concerning that cup, it's written, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I shall make with them in the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, and he said, You can take it then. This cup is the new covenant written in my blood, which is shed for you. So you can take the cup together. Matthew 27, excuse me, 26, verse 27. When he took the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
the saving power of the shed blood of the old covenant pashal lamb was becoming the shed blood of the new covenant lamb yes. of God who takes away the sins of the world. So consider this. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, remember what he prayed? My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, the cup of judgment, may your will be done. When Jesus said these words, it can almost seem like, oh, can the death of the cross be taken away from me? Can that be? He was talking about the cup of judgment because the sins of the world, not just who was existing at that time, the sins of all people that would ever exist would be on Jesus at that very moment. He would take on all of our sins. Imagine the sin we live with, how horrible it is. He took on all the sins of the world. That's love that he willingly said, Father, let your will be done. It was a cup of judgment. I believe when Jesus said that, one of the most agonizing things was that there would be that separation from his father. That he knew when he drank this cup of judgment, he would be separated from his father for that moment because he took on the sins of the world. That separation is what you and I deal with all the time. That we feel separated from God because of the sins that we have. And Jesus loved you and I so much that he said, I don't want you to be separated from the Father because I know exactly what that felt like. He knows what we go through. He was tempted in every way yet without sin. But he became sin so that we could be righteous in the eyes of God. He drank our cup of judgment and in exchange, he gave us the cup of redemption to drink in remembrance of him. He died a judgmental death so that we could live and be redeemed. And he said, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At the same time, we proclaim the Lord's death, we proclaim our own death, the dying to our old life, our own self, that we were bought with a price, and that price is the Lamb of God, the blood of the Lamb. And when we take this cup, we are agreeing that our life comes out of death. That Passover, communion is a repeated feast, telling over and over again that our old life dies so that we can have a new life in the Spirit. In fact, Galatians tells us, it is I who no longer lives, but Christ who lives in me. That right there is the heart of our faith as a Christian. He brings everything to closure at that one act of saying, I will take the judgment of all the sins of the world and all the people of the world, even people that will reject me, I'll take on their judgment. Even the people that will stray away from me, even after they've accepted me and they stray away, he said, I will still take on their judgment. There's nowhere you can run because I've already taken on your judgment. There's no sin that is too powerful to take you over because he's already taken over the judgment side of it. That's why he says I, that God will never give us any more than we can handle. He already took the judgment for us. There's a fourth cup on the table. And Susie's going to explain a little bit. The fourth cup is called the cup of praise. This is the cup that he did not drink that night. He said in Matthew 26, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you, with me, with you, with his disciples in the Father's kingdom. And then they sung a hymn, and he went out to the Mount of Olives, and you know the story after that. This cup is also called the cup of consummation, and it is the cup that we will drink with him in the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is Jewish custom for a bride and a groom to share a cup of wine at their wedding, and we will one day when he comes back again, drink that cup with him. 
Revelations 19:19 19, 19 says, Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So that is our glorious hope, that we will once again be with him. And actually, I'm telling you, I can't wait. Can you imagine now that you have this understanding of drinking that cup with him at the marriage supper? Because I fully believe that's what we're going to do. And just, a, a, just in thankfulness to what he's done for us. The Jewish people don't understand this. They don't think the Messiah has come yet. So please pray for them, for the veil. I mean, there's a remnant like myself, but pray for them that the veil will be lifted off their eyes so that they can see. But the Jewish Seder always ends with the same words of hope because they, they know that when Messiah comes, they will go to Jerusalem. And so they say, L'shana haba barush next year in Jerusalem. Let's say the English part together. Next, next year, year in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So the Passover, it really, it, it kind of draws us into understanding the fulfillment of the past deliverance from bondage and our present sin, but then the future of being with God in the new Jerusalem, in the new year. As the Bible says, there's a, there's a new, there's Zion, the, it's a poetic way of saying Jerusalem, or the new Zion, that we will all be in the new Jerusalem. And remember, Jerusalem was representing God. That was where his glory was supposed to be represented. So you and I will one day be with God in all of his glory. And this is so wise of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He's so good at parables, illustrations, and stories that he left one cup left as our hope to say to us, it's not over yet. Mm. That's why he says, I, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And if anyone lets me in, I will come in, sit with them, and dine with them. That's what our Lord wants. He just wants to be with us. It's a relationship more than a ritual. Because that's how much God loves us. And this week as we celebrate not just Passover, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we die to ourselves, he resurrects us into the new life he has for us. All that we go through is not in vain because of the Savior. I know there are things stirring in our hearts. There are a lot that we've learned tonight. But probably the best way for us to end tonight is to worship the Lamb of God. So I'm going to ask for you to bow your heads. In fact, actually, we can stand right now and, then, and, and bow our heads together. And can we just say thank you to Susie? Uh, do you have anything uh, else to say? Yeah. Can we just say thank you so much? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. In fact, the worship team can come out also. And just bow your heads for a moment. Lord, I know that there are many things that are stirring in our hearts and things that we've been learning tonight. And we know that you are the reason why we're here. That everything pointed to you from the exodus of Egypt and being slaves and living in bondage and slavery and being set free but still wandering around. Many of us can relate to that. We're set free from our sin, yet we still wander around in this world. But Lord, you came to free us. Because of your blood that was shed for us, you pass over judgment on us. Now we have a new life in you. And although we, we have a new life in you, for many of us, tonight is that exchange from judgment to redemption, that we should no longer live as people who are judged, but people who are redeemed, yes. that we should no longer live in the ways that we used to because that's our old life. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We are a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. And you gave us a new covenant written in your blood. You took the cup of suffering. Mm so that we could have the cup of a new life. And so I pray for all of us tonight that we would have that new life. Thank you. 
this new life in you. For you are worthy to be praised as a lamb who was slain. Holy is your name. Mm. We praise your name. You, you praise your name. Holy is the lamb of God. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. And we all said, amen. amen. Let's sing this together. Can we thank the lamb of God?